we have come to lecture number 8 in our uh, building services to electrical services and illumination lecture series on vtv section of program and uh, in this uh, this is part of your module 2 seconds hub building we have discussed uh, about the uh, types of renewable energy systems on site and off site and in this we will be studying about uh, achieving net zero building design through utilization of the other utilization of the previously discussed well, renewable energy sources and the systems and we will conclude the module with energy conservation techniques in electrical systems so what does a net zero energy building mean so with uh, various definitions that is available so if we have to come to one definition we can uh, to begin with an understanding a net zero energy building can combine exemplary building design to minimize energy requirements and also renewable energy systems that meet reduced energy needs one is the design of the building itself should be in such a fashion that it minimizes the energy requirements second is renewable energy systems that meet these reduced energy level so it has to function in tandem complementing each other so that ultimately we reduce the energy consumption this get on to with this topic further we will quickly understand what is on site renewable energy and off site renewable energy on site uh, to put it in simple terms when uh, we have all of these uh, uh, systems uh, that we spoke in our previous uh, uh, lecture available in our own site in our own campus in our own facility it is going to be on site so basically we are going to uh, generate whatever we want uh, what our building wants in terms of its requirements and not going to borrow anything else from the government supplier from anything outside so when we produce what we want Uh, it is our on site of course it is uh, sorry that it doesn't mean that we are not going to borrow anything out so whenever we produce what we want it is going to be on site and when it is produced somewhere else when you when these uh, renewable energy sources are produced somewhere else and it is brought to our facility it can be produced by anybody uh, the government or a third party provided or our own uh, facilities sub facility or whatever just because of the space constraint we can't produce it in a main facility but it is still uh, somewhere else <coughs> away from the main uh, consumer so that becomes offset so when you have when you produce your own in energy in your own uh, premises it is going to be on site and when you're going to take it from uh, some other person or some other agency who is producing it uh, off your site that is going to be offset renewable energy right Uh, so we will quickly give it a read as to <coughs> understand what it means by definition once uh, efficiency measures have been incorporated the remaining energy needs to can needs can be met using renewable energy technologies common on site electricity generation strategies include pv panels solar water heating and wind turbines renewable on site thermal energy can also be provided by effective use of biomass wood wood pellets agricultural waste and similar products can be burnt on site to provide space heating service water heating etc biofuels such as biodiesel may also be used in conjunction with conventional fossil fuels to meet thermal load so all that we discussed in the previous uh, session has been uh, told here in terms of what can be the on site renewable energy systems or sources off site renewable energy is uh, basically depending upon the net zero energy matrix and guidelines used buildings may be permitted to use energy generated off site to offset energy used in a building by installing dedicated wind turbines solar collectors etc etc at a separate location so large utility wind farms utility scale wind farms solar plants geothermal plants and hydropower facilities generate electricity without using fossil fuels or private primary energy uh, so now this completes what we been talking about in terms of on site and off site renewable energy moving on further we come back to our net zero energy building so from the national uh, renewable energy laboratory nrel which is in the us and not in india publication zero energy buildings uh, the definition a critical look to define net zero building or energy building uh, explores definition in detail and it has come up with four ways in which 
a net zero energy may be defined so the four <coughs> ways one can understand net zero energy building is from the site net zero site energy we will uh, understand these in the in detail in the next in the following uh, slides one is site energy next is net zero source energy and net zero energy cost followed by net zero energy emissions so starts with site and source and whatever energy is going to be associated with these two and energy emissions associated in this entire process so we will take up net zero site energy first so what is a net zero site energy so site energy refers to the energy consumed and generated at a site regardless of where or how that energy originated in a net zero site energy building for every unit of energy the building consumes over a year it must generate one unit of energy i hope this is pretty clear so site energy uh, refers to anything that is consumed as well as generated at a site regardless of wherever the materials that we bring into the site or consume at the site originated so whatever we do whatever energy we consume to produce something uh, or uh, whatever we generate in the process of producing something within a site all all that accounts to site energy and in a net site net zero net zero site energy building for every unit of energy the building consumes one unit has to be generated as well with this understanding moving for the source energy so we spoke about four ways one is site uh, site energy next is source energy source energy refers to primary energy needed to extract and deliver energy to a site including the energy that may be lost or wasted in the process of generation transmission and distribution i'll treat it again source energy refers to the primary energy needed to extract and deliver energy to a site so basically it is about extraction and delivery of energy to a site including the energy that is lost or wasted in this process of generation transmission and distribution uh, i have given an example here for example a coal burning power plant may generate 1 joule of electricity for every 3 joules of electricity in the coal consumed if natural gas is used instead of coal at a site for every 20 joules consumed 1 joule may be needed to extract and distribute the gas to the site so what we are talking about is it is not just the 3 it is always the 3 plus 1 or it is not just the 1 or 20 it is about the 20 and 1 together metrics for net zero source energy buildings account for these factors do exact exact metrics can vary depending on site and utility factors moving on further next is net zero energy cost this perhaps the simplest metric to use it means that the building has an electricity utility energy utility bill of 0 dollars rupees 0 over the course of a year in some cases building owners or operators may take advantage of the of selling Uh, renewable energy credits from on-site renewable generation so this means the building has an electricity or energy bill of 0 rupees over the course of a year which means it is producing all that it needs by itself in some cases uh, this uh, particular discussion that i'm showing here is probably uh, taken references from uh, us where they talk about renewable energy credits but uh, it is not very uh, different from what we are doing because in the uh, chapter where we discussed about uh, electricity or uh, electricity bills reading about electricity bills uh, at least in sescom which i have explained in my class there's an or you can go to your house and take the electricity bills and see you have something called as a solar rebate for which you get a concession in your electricity bill so it is something like very similar to that where if at all a building owner or an operator produce more energy that they actually need so those energy can be converted into credits or it can be sold back to the government in this case which is also happening in some of uh, some parts of our country as well right so the net zero energy cost is we are not going to pay anybody anything for uh, uh, for anything that we are going to consume in our building in the form of any uh, type of energy next is our 
net zero energy emissions. Many conventional energy sources result in emissions of carbon dioxide, nitrogen oxides, sulfur dioxide and many other gases. A net zero energy emission building either uses no energy which results in emissions or offsets the emissions by exporting emissions free energy typically from on-site renewable energy systems. So we are talking about any conventional energy will result in uh, several emissions of unwanted gases. Uh, <clears throat> so net zero energy emissions building either uses no energy which results in such emissions. So uh, we are talking about this entire process being taken care of in such a fashion that we are not going to release or result <clears throat> or even as a byproduct have some kind of energy which is going to result in this emissions emissions of these harmful gases or offsets the emissions by exporting emission free energy right so how do you avoid it so you can offset the emissions by uh, exporting emissions free energy typically from on uh, on site renewable energy systems right so with these four si uh, site source cost and emissions if we can take care of all these facets of the energy management system, we can achieve something which can be called as net zero energy building or design. Right. Uh, with that said and done, so uh, keeping that in mind, all that we discuss or uh, design is going to be our net zero energy uh, building using the uh, renewable on-site and off-site renewable energy systems. And moving on to the next topic, we have energy conservation techniques in electrical systems. There are a couple of them which we have listed, uh, mm, some of which are uh, completely technical into the electrical uh, engineering uh, terminologies. We might find it easier or difficult to understand, but nevertheless, we just have to know all these uh, exist and what are these. And apart from that, when it goes to the lighting part, I think uh, we will be good because we have a separate module which talks about lighting and all that. So needless to worry about it, let's get into what each of these are. So I have listed eight of them, uh, not limited to just those eight, but yes, we have eight of them. Maximum demand, uh, which we have studied in our first module. So there's something called maximum demand controllers. Automatic power factor controller, power factor, yes, we have studied in module 1. Energy efficient motors, by the name we understand the motors have to be energy efficient. Soft starters, something which is getting started have to be start, we will see what it is, which is again a motor. Uh, VSDs, variable speed devices, energy efficient transformers, electronic ballast, occupancy sensors and energy efficient lighting controls. Maximum demand controllers, I will uh, give these definitions a quick read and uh, we will try to understand what uh, these are <clears throat> so high tension consumers have to pay a maximum demand charge in addition to the usual charge for the number of units consumed this charge is usually based on the highest amount of power used during some period say 30 minutes during the metering month the maximum demand charge often represents a large proportion of the total bill and may be based on only one isolated 30 minute episode of high power use. Considerable savings can be realized by monitoring power use and turning off or reducing non-essential loads during such periods of high power use. I'll read this again, sounds important. Considerable savings can be realized by monitoring power use and turning off or reducing non-essential goods loads during such periods of high power use. Maximum demand controller is a device designed to meet the need of the industry conscious of the value of load management. So we understand that there is something a uh, particular period in which highest amount of power is getting recorded during a part in during a meterable metering month and uh, the high end cost high tension customers have to pay something called as a maximum demand charge and that is based on this highest power recorded during for a very short time during a metering month and this 
represents represents the total uh, portion of the bill so if we have to control these uh, monitor and control this 30 minute or the short period of time where uh, we are achieving a peak uh, usage or load if we can monitor that and control that is going to give us so much of uh, savings in terms of our electricity bills provided we are a high tension consumers hd consumers so maximum demand controller is a device which is designed to meet uh, where we can monitor and control this maximum demand uh, time by switching off or it gives input signal so that we, we can act based on its suggestions or it can be directly uh, linked to the system in such a fashion that it controls <coughs> uh, the way the energy is managed right moving on to the next one which is automatic power factor controllers uh various types of automatic power factor controllers are available with relay or microprocessor logic two of the most common controls are voltage control next is kvar control which is nothing but kilo volt amps reactor right so this is expressed to uh, measure the reactive power so voltage control voltage alone can be used as a source of intelligence when the switched capacitors are applied at a point where circuit voltage decreases as circuit load increases voltage is the most common type of intelligence used in substation applications when maintaining a particular voltage is of prime importance this type of control is independent of the load cycle so voltage alone so in the first uh, power factor controllers the signal the input signal is going to be voltage they are going to be the source of intelligence when the switched capacitors are applied at a point where the circuit voltage decreases as the circuit load increases and the switched capacitors are applied at a point where circuit voltage decreases when the circuit load increases right uh, so <clears throat> this is the philosophy or the concept which is used behind substation applications where there is so much of stepping up and stepping down of voltages right so when uh, it comes to maintaining a particular voltage uh, we have to use this type of power factor controllers which is based on voltage control this is independent of the load cycle So kilowatt, which is kilo K V A R kilowatt amps reactive sensitive controls. When it comes to kilowatt sensitive controls, we use them at locations where the voltage level is closely regulated. Voltage level is is closely regulated, but not available as a control variable. The capacitors can be switched to respond to a decreasing power factor as a result of change in system voltage. This type of control can also be used to avoid penalty on low power factor by adding capacitors in steps such as the system power factor begins to lag behind the desired value. Uh, so when the voltage level is closely regulated so that's the difference between regulating and controlling in kilowatt con sensitive controls we are going to regulate but not the but not control the voltage level the capacitors can be switched Uh, to respond to a decreasing power factor as a result of change in system loading so this is dependent upon the load cycle or the loading in the system right so this type of control can also be used to avoid penalty on low power factor by adding capacitors in steps as the system power uh, factor begins to lag behind the desired value so there are uh, cases where uh, the uh, electricity energy provider finds the consumer when the power factor drops below the acceptable levels so this type of control can put in additional capacitors so that we don't uh, let the power factor systems power factor go beyond go la, go below the accepted value right apart from these two there is a few other power factor uh, <coughs> uh, controllers one is a power factor controller with relay which is uh, controls the power factor of the installation by giving signals to switch on or off power factor correction capacitors relay is the brain of the control circuit and needs contactors of appropriate rating for switching on or switching off the capacitors intelligent power factor controllers determines the rating of capacitance connected in each step 
during the first hour of its operation. Controls the capacitance connected in each step during the first hour of its operation and stores them in memory. Based on this measurement, the intelligent power factor uh, controller switches on the most appropriate steps, thus eliminating the hunting problems normally associated with capacitor switching. So it studies, it uses the first one hour as the data and according to that it modi uh, modifies alters the remaining step switches on the most appropriate step so that it eliminates the hunting problem normally associated with capacitance switching capacitor switching and energy efficient motor when we talk about efficiency it is all about reducing losses so minimizing watts loss in motors which means reduce losses is improved efficiency uh, the energy efficient motors are usually just because efficiency is good, they are going to last longer. They uh, should be chosen with 1.15 service factors. Uh, power problem should be taken care as to, uh, okay, so there should not be any fluctuation or power interruption. So that such kind of power problem should be taken care to uh, maintain and <coughs> prevent these motors from damage, speed control has to be again taken care of because it shouldn't be uh, starting from a <coughs> very high speed and uh, there should not be so much of fluctuation and the starting torque should also be taken care of. So these are some of the specifications that uh, is being listed. Uh, this uh, is uh, the entire article is from to uh, Bureau of Energy Efficiency India. So some of, in some cases they have uh, given the specifications as to what should be followed or what uh, could be preferred as a suggestion. So some cases I have put that as well. Uh, moving on further, soft starters. When starting AC induction motors, so this is all getting into the uh, technical part of the motors, induction and all that. Uh, in either ways we will uh, quickly give it a read as to know what we are talking about. So when starting AC induction motor develops more torque than is required at full speed. This trace is transferred to the mechanical transmission system resulting in excessive wear and premature failure of chains and accessories. Additionally, rapid acceleration also has a massive impact on electricity supply charges with high inrush currents drawing up to 600% of the normal run current. Soft starter provides a reliable and economical solution to these problems by delivering a controlled release of power to the motor, thereby providing smooth stepless acceleration and deceleration. De de Motor life will be extended as damage to windings and bearings is reduced. So this corresponds to the previous slide where we spoke about energy efficient motors and there are, we spoke about a couple of problems about the motors in terms of speed, initial torque and all that. So the soft starter is something which responds to, uh, corresponds to that where it takes care of a couple of such problems that be increasing the efficiency and also the motor life. Moving on further, variable speed drives, VSDs, uh, is also called as ASDs, adjustable speed drives, that can vary the speed of a normally fixed speed motor. Uh, VFDs are, there are so many, uh, this is one of the, this is one of the important uh, principle uh, when we even uh, study HVAC related uh, control uh, HVAC in our next uh, semester. VFDs are uh, really a, <coughs> an innovation in the field of mechanical engineering where uh, there will be sensors which varies the speed so according to the necessity. So this VSDs, uh, <coughs> so in this context in whatever I displayed here in the slide, it is going to vary the speed according to the requirement. So, uh, let us take this example when uh, we are riding a bicycle uh, depending upon our requirement we increase or decrease the speed and uh, keep the ride go up and uh, running. It is something very similar to that where uh, the motor is going to adapt to such concept where depending upon the load requirement it is going to increase its speed and depending upon when in idle time when it really doesn't have to produce so much of power, churn out so much of power, it reduces the speed and provides the minimum power it is designed to produce. Uh, this is a major uh, 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 concept in our AC where, uh, uh, you know, that is, I feel is something very easy to relate to where uh, when there are 10 occupants in a building, I don't have to blow enough air. In such cases, I can reduce the speed and just blow, uh, you know, fresh air for 
just two to three people depending upon the uh, occupancy of the present in the room or space when there are 10 people all of them are going to generate heat and the sensor detects so much of carbon dioxide getting out and heat getting liberated and sends instructions to the uh, motor which is here and which is going to pump out more fresh air into the room right uh, so this is one example and uh, this is being adopted in majority of the uh, motors wherever we have we can uh, plug in such application this comes into picture and so the definition i'll leave it to you so this simply to put it really simple it modifies the speed according to the requirement it is applicable in a variety of devices whatever we could think of energy efficient transformers moving on to the next one uh, most of these type type uh, transformers occurs through heat or vibration from the core so uh, i as i asked you to uh, study about the transformers go through some of the technical aspect of it core single core double core and all that so most of these drive type uh, transformers use a core and uh, through heat or vibration from off from the core there is so much of lo uh, losses associated energy losses associated with it so the new high energy transformers minimize the losses these losses uh, by replacing the silicon alloyed iron core with an amorphous, amorphous material a metallic glass alloy by using this most of these energy losses can be removed and we have some statistics here we can uh, have increased efficiencies even at low loads and efficiency uh, <coughs> which is like 98.5% efficiency at even just 35% load uh, moving on further electronic ballast so these ballasts are nothing but your uh, the box that we used to see in the center of our Uh, tube lights fluorescent lamps these days it is getting smaller and smaller and uh, some of the concealed tube lights you don't even see the ballast it is inbuilt right so we will study what a ballast is a conventional ballast make use of kick caused by sudden physical disruption of current in an inductive circuit to produce the high voltage required for starting the lamp and rely on reactive voltage drop in the ballast to reduce voltage applied across the lamp on account of the mechanical switch which is the starter and low resistance of filament when cold the uncontrolled filament current generally tend to go beyond the limits specified by indian standard specifications with high values of current and flux densities the operational losses and temperature rise are on the higher side in a conventional choke the high frequency electronic ballast overcomes above drawbacks the basic functions of electronic ballast are ignite the lamp stabilize the gas discharge to supply power to the lamp so ballast is something which helps you start the lamp and it has to stabilize the gas discharge and also provide power to the lamp so this was conventionally done by the previous generation ballast where we don't use electricity so it was a it was a mechanical process and uh, in the definition we've been talking about the limits and how difficult or lengthy uh, process that was so with uh, just by replacing the conventional ballast with electronic ballast we can perform all the operations quickly and at uh, with minimum losses moving on further occupancy sensors and energy efficient lighting controls when it comes to uh, lighting controls the options are really really huge uh, right from okay we will discuss about that after the slide occupancy linked control can be achieved using infrared acoustic ultrasonic or microwave sensors which detect either movement or noise in room spaces these sensors switch lighting on when occupancy is detected and off again after a set time period when no occupancy movement detected they are designed to override manual switches and to prevent a situation where lighting is left on in unoccupied spaces With this type of system it is important to incorporate a built-in time delay since occupants often remain still qu or quiet for short periods and do not appreciate being plunged into darkness if not constantly moving around. Uh, next is time based controlled uh, timed turn off switches are the least expensive type of automatic lighting control. In some cases their low cost and ease of installation makes it desirable to use them uh, where more efficient controls would be too expensive. 
So these are just two of the possibilities which is listed here. Like I told you when it comes to lighting and lighting controls and uh, systems, there are so many innovations and options and strategies that one could think of. Uh, over here, like they told, there are, <coughs> so one is occupancy related uh, link time control where uh, we use several types of sensors uh, from infrared to acoustic to ultra sonic or microwave sensors which detect the uh, uh, you know occupants movement or noise in room spaces so depending upon the movement if they detect any movement and so this uh, <coughs> works when there is a dark room with uh, automatic sensors occupancy sensors enable lighting system when some of the occupant let's say a person enters the room and it quickly detects the occupant's uh, movement and sends information and in turn the lights switch on but what happens let's say after a period of 15 20 minutes when the occupant comes and gets settled in his uh, chair and his workstation and you can hardly sense any movement because he is focused on his uh, work in such cases it might or might not sense and it might go off <coughs> all right so in such cases uh, this so we have to set these or program these occupancy uh, linked controls in such a fashion that they don't go off so often that somebody has to make some movement in in response to in in a way to get the lights on so uh, this is very similar to our uh, phone screens or uh, computer uh, uh, laptop screens where after a period of inactivity it goes to sleep or it switches off the display so these time is something which we can set in such a fashion that we don't have to make any extra movements to switch it on or switch it off uh, that is with our occupancy related uh, lighting uh, so what what they discuss here is just that we don't have to do it for short periods it has to be for a at least considerable time that a person moves in that particular span of time so time based control systems are something which uh, uh, <coughs> it is basically just a switch which uh, is linked to a time span so once when this is put on once when let's say we uh, can take this example of a place where usually the employees come for three hours so when we put the switch on at uh, let's say for a shift of six to nine in the evening and we put the switch on at 5 45 and we also set the time of this has to be on for four hours so 6 45 7 45 8 45 9 45 where the employees are going to expect it to leave at nine plus minus even if the last person who leaves the hall is going to spend his time for the let's say half an hour 45 minutes extra by 9 45 everything goes off so this is uh, time turn of switches they are relatively very cheap and uh, that makes it very uh, <coughs> desirable to use and when more efficient controls are considered to be expensive before we close the session this is a quick uh, fact this is a month old we are talking about the statistics as per this is still 2019 in fact this is a gif file i am not sure the GIF file so what happens is we have uh, in 2019 we have india as a country have come to 24.27 terawatt hour in terms of the top 10 solar energy producing countries with uh, uh, china very 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 uh, far beyond reach by any other countries the entire Europe together is producing 38, whereas China has crossed 100 uh, terawatt, per hour, terawatt hour. And uh, uh, for that matter, India is also doing better because when we go back in the time, in, India was not even there in the picture. So uh, in the recent past, we have come uh, over, we have come and we are growing in such a fashion that we have. Uh, oh, uh, crossed past several other uh, important countries and we have current we are currently number five at this solar energy producing countries and i hope we will move on further uh, yeah, before we again close uh, we i have identified some of these buildings where uh, they uh, call these as intelligent buildings why we have them here is uh, to understand uh, if they have some done something which is uh, very close to what we are looking at in terms of the net zero or the electricity 
consumption at over 828 meters which this is the this is the tallest building in the world at present so they use an automation system which use smart algorithm to identify maintenance issues uh, recycling systems to use gravity to discharge water from floor drains to sewage ac systems draw cooler air from upper floors so basically they don't produce the air they use the ambient air and it is used to cool the upper floors unmanned machines cleans the top 27 floors of windows so all these windows are again automated okay so move on moving on to the next one capital tower at singapore uh, this is the largest buildings in singapore energy recovering system and air conditioning system allows recovery of cool air double glass windows okay car parking fitted with carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide monitoring devices ensuring optimal air quality levels so whoever is interested can get into the details of this and see how they Uh, monitor and uh, what happens after they detect the levels are uh, increasing and what how what do they do to bring them back to the normal temperature and we go to the crystal uh, london this is supposed to be one of the most sustainable buildings in the world uh, over 3500 data points used to monitor it with 70% low carbon emission so this is very close to the a um, uh, fourth point that we discussed under net zero energy buildings where we spoke about uh, energy emissions right so there are over 3500 data points just to monitor the carbon emissions so that it is 70% lower so this is not completely a uh, net zero building but we are talking about the energy emissions that we discussed 100% electric building means it is not using any other fossil fuels or any other energy forms to produce electricity that it needs uh, self shading facades allow 70% of visible light through each window means when they say it is 100% electric building and the next point they talk about self shading facades which allow 70% of visible light through the beach through each window it talks about reduced energy consumption and so i don't have to unnecessarily uh, produce a churn out more energy where i'm where i know i'm going to waste them so <coughs> that makes it yeah, uh, probably reduce electric electricity or energy consumption in all respects which uh, could qualify as a zero energy building and the next is duke energy center at uh, <coughs> uh, us certified as the first and the tallest office tower to receive the highest level of sustainability what makes it smart 26 million gallons per year treated underwater sorry treated groundwater make up for its cooling system which means you will be studying about hvac in the next semester uh, we are talking about treated groundwater making up for its cooling system so depending upon the uh, type and ambience and so many other factors we get to decide what type of uh, hvac system that we are going to put in a particular building and uh, if it is a water cooled system so it needs so much of water to cool the air so that it the air gets uh, treated and circulated back to the room to <coughs> cool the space So what they are talking about here is they treat 26 million gallons of treated water, treated groundwater, and they use it for the their cooling system. Daylight harvesting blinds provide natural light. Uh, means <coughs> these uh, blinds we will have to again get into the design and understand what it is about. So these daylight harvesting blinds provide natural light. Uh, they are going to make space for natural light, or are they? going to collect something <coughs> uh, like our solar system is something which we have to understand 24% of the material used in the construction contain recycled content so uh, this could uh, go back to our uh, points which we discussed uh, site energy if the material is uh, recycled material that they are talking about is within the site so maybe we are talking we are talking about reduced site energy levels or uh, if it is from uh, so this has a direct impact on the uh, source energy where the source itself is the site so the cost of transportation the energy associated with the transportation from the 
generation distribution and all that is less so 24 percent of the materials used in the entire construction contains recycled content reduces site energy source energy uh, probably emission cost and also the sorry energy cost and also the uh, energy emissions so uh, that is <coughs> something which we will have to look at again retaining storm waters water for use equals reduced cost so they have a smart uh, storm water management system for use that again equals a reduced cost otherwise we will have to get it from the government supply use it in such a fashion that for a regular uh, purposes this being the office tower and it is going to have uh, a supply of water and also grey waste and black waste and again it has to be treated and the treated groundwater goes uh, where are they recycling it again or it is getting them to the let uh, getting mixed to the main city municipal drainage or waste so by retaining storm water again the storm water uh, depends upon in a place like us uh, we have to again get into the data uh, of how much of storm water how much of uh, rain that uh, this receives and how much of it is being collected and stored for uh, various other uses but uh, yes retaining storm water for use equals reduced cost uh, with this we have come to module 2 if i have to again summarize it quickly uh, from module 1 till here we have started with uh, uh, basics of electricity where we um, try to understand our so 8th grade, 9th grade sciences, uh, electrons, protons and all that and we started with uh, electricity generation sources, uh, types of sources, so after it gets generated what happens, we studied about GTD, generation, transmission and distribution and how it reaches the substation uh, in our locality, what happens in the substation <coughs> and after it reaches a substation, how does it reach? How does it reach our uh, premises, be it our residences or uh, industries, be it a low, be it a low uh, tension or low voltage consumer or a high voltage consumer? How does it reach his or her premises? And after it reaches uh, our premise, how are we going to plan and take the electricity up and down or uh, horizontally in our building? depending upon the function that we have <coughs> so with that we stop with uh, electricity uh, GTD generation transmission distribution and something uh, inside the building and in this module uh, the second part in fact of this module we spoke about various renewable energy systems we gave a, we had a small introduction to uh, the types of renewable energy system on site and off site and net zero energy building designs and a uh, uh, few factors about energy conservation techniques in electricity and we have com completed this module 2 in module 3 we'll be talking about uh, protecting uh, protective devices like switch gear uh, fuses and all that followed by uh, earthing and lightning arresters and with that this en this entire syllabus uh, electricity and its uh, associated topics will get over with module 3 and module 4 will be writing and illumination and module 5 will be data and uh, preparation of electric layout so see you again in module 3 with the protective devices protection devices and earthing and lightning arresters thank you